Hello all and welcome to Stingray Toms, Florida. I thought I'd do something different today since this is my 50th video on this channel. Think of this as sort of a behind the scenes video. The channel is nearly at 100 subscribers as well, so I wanted to thank all of you who have subscribed and watched my videos so far. When I subtitle my videos as either a dip into the archive or a deeper dive into the archive, I'm referring to utilizing a sizable collection of documents to cover nearly 150 years of Florida's tourism history. In this video, I'll give you a quick look into the collection and describe the various types of documents. Enjoy! The archive for Stingray Toms, Florida began in the 1970s and grew in two ways. Firstly, everywhere I've traveled, I collected the contemporary brochures, maps, and guides from each attraction. Secondly, I've searched antique shops, auctions, bookstores, and collector shows to find other documents. I scan each document and file them. Much of the time, while I'm doing research, I work with the scanned images, but there's nothing quite like looking through the actual documents in the archive like I'm showing here. By definition, the entire collection is fragile, since it's nearly entirely paper. It's collectively known as ephemera, that's the term for any written or printed matter that isn't meant to be retained or preserved. So yes, much of the archive is comprised of items that were never meant to last longer than about a year. Most of it was designed to be used once and then thrown away, so the fact that so much of it is preserved is remarkable. The archive contains books, booklets, magazines, brochures, guides, postcards, maps, audio and video recordings, photo slides, press packets, and press photos, as well as printed photos and slides. While most of the items were created for Florida's tourists, there are also internal documents from some of the attractions. Likewise, while much of the items were created by the attractions, there are many magazines, guides, maps, and brochures that were published by federal, state, and local governments, as well as tourism organizations that promoted all or parts of Florida's tourism industry. For instance, several of these organizations were connected to a specific route or highway system, such as the Orange Blossom Trail Association, whose brochures are seen here. There are also quite a few documents created by the Florida Attractions Association, an organization that was created by the owners of several of the larger attractions in order to enable them to pool resources primarily for promotional purposes. Not only was the FAA a significant tourism organization in the past, its work continues today. I'm going to briefly cover what the types of documents are and how they can be valuable for historic research. Whether this will be useful is debatable, but at least it gives me something to talk about while I show some fascinating examples from the archive. Books. While there are many books in the archive, most of them are secondary sources, meaning that they're histories or travel books that cite or comment on original content. These can be useful, but other titles like these here are arguably more informative. Like nearly all other documents in the archive, these are primary sources and include the narrative of explorer William Bartram in the 18th century, interviews of formerly enslaved Floridians, a guide to Florida's historic markers, which lists each of the state's 200 markers as of 1976 and their contents, and autobiographical writings of Jack Rudlow, sea life expert and founder of the Gulf Specimen Marine Laboratory in Panacea. Booklets come in two categories. The first are the guidebooks that people could pick up on their vacation, often created by the tourist board of a city or county. They detail the information that visitors might need, including restaurants, hotels, attractions, night spots, gift shops, etc. The other type is the souvenir book. 
Usually created by larger attractions, they include many photos along with a description of the attraction and sometimes its history. These were often only available for purchase in an attraction's gift shop. I'm particularly sad that these have all but stopped being published in the last 20 years. I'm not sure why, but it probably has to do with the cost of printing versus the number of sales. Magazines are rather obvious, especially considering they're often titles such as Life, Look, and National Geographic. The interesting part is that while some, such as the ones I'm showing, feature what we consider news articles, it's clear that others contain articles that were essentially written by the attraction the article reports on. Both Cypress Gardens and Walt Disney World were rather famous for doing this. See this article on Cypress Gardens and how its owner, Dick Pope, achieved photos that weren't completely factual. These types of articles help keep the attraction in the public's mind. Brochures and guides often get placed together as they're typically the same format. A single sheet of paper folded so the dimensions are about 4 by 9 inches. Initially, this was so attractions could pop them in a standard envelope and mail them, but later, their standardized form allowed them to be put in display racks located in a variety of tourist-related establishments in the state. Attractions would provide the brochures, and the racks would contain dozens of different brochures for attractions, lodging, restaurants, shops, and any business that was included in the tourist trade. Today, there are distribution companies that handle the majority of brochure racks in places such as hotel lobbies, stores, tourist information centers, and restaurants. At first, the brochures were advertisements like these here for Marine Studios. They would paint a brief and hopefully exciting picture of the attraction, often with photos covering what travelers would find when they visited. Interestingly, they rarely gave specific addresses for the attractions which for those that are long closed makes it that much more difficult to pinpoint their location. But the lack of addresses was for a couple reasons. One, many more rural places didn't have addresses as we think of them today. And two, once tourists got to the general location of an attraction, there would be billboards and other directional signs to help them find their goal. While often looking much like brochures, Guides are a different matter altogether. Guides weren't used much in Florida until the 1970s. They are created by the attractions for the use of people actually visiting the parks. They normally contain a map, a list of the sites to see, and possibly show times, as well as information on gift shops and restaurants, if any. Small attractions typically didn't need anything like this, instead simply using signs located around the place. It was really the development of theme parks that made them necessary. For the first time, visitors would be spending the entire day at one place, and it was pretty obvious that a certain amount of planning and organization would be beneficial to get the most out of the day. While postcards aren't remotely as popular as they used to be, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what they are. Someday I'll take a real look at the evolution of the postcard, especially as it pertains to Florida, but at this point, suffice it to say they're a good source of photos and artwork. The larger attractions such as Cypress Gardens, Parrot Jungle, and Wikiwachi produce large numbers of cards over the years, while many of the smaller attractions don't appear to have produced any. The other aspect of postcards is the debate between ones that have been mailed and those that haven't. It comes down to several points. Postmarks with dates can be useful since most cards don't have a copyright date in themselves. That being said, many attractions would sell the same card over quite a few years, so a postmark date could be 10 or more years after the card was initially printed. That means when I'm sharing the images of cards on my videos, the date I list is usually the date a card was for sale, not necessarily the date it was printed. Maps are the next category and are self-explanatory. These were often produced by the oil and gas companies, as well as regular map or cartography companies. From the 1930s through the 1970s, Silver Springs provided a reasonably good map in its promotional brochures that even listed some of the other attractions in the state through its membership in the Florida Attractions Association. 
There aren't as many maps in the archive as one might expect because they actually don't convey all that much information about Florida attractions. Also, not surprisingly, maps don't change all that much from year to year. In fact, what I tend to look for in a highway-style map is all the extras. Does it list attractions and state parks? Are there photos? What insert maps does it show that might be helpful? Outside of printed materials fall both audio and video recordings, in the forms of records, tapes, CDs, and DVDs. This is the category with the smallest number of items since very few attractions produced recorded music or video presentations. Most of what I found are items that would have been sold in gift shops, though there's at least one record album that is as much promotional as it was a souvenir. It was created by the state for the 1964 New York World's Fair. I've already featured this album in a video, which you can see here. One of the other albums in the archive is this one, featuring the bands that performed at Busch Gardens in the late 1970s. More modern items include this Walt Disney World promotional video and a DVD from SeaWorld. I've done a video on photo slides, specifically the Panaview slides that were common in the 1970s and 80s. Panaview and other brands of slides were sold in sleeves of four or five slides on racks and gift shops throughout the state. Like postcards, they showed some of the more interesting scenes, and most attractions had several different collections. They were generally bought by visitors who were already shooting slides themselves. Check out my video on them here. I can combine the next two types of items, press or media packets, and press photos, as they of course are pretty similar. Press packets are documents that were created by attractions for the press to use in stories. Often they promote something newly opened, or in this case, the release of the movie Jaws 3, which is in the archive because the movie was filmed at, and featured, SeaWorld in Orlando. Press photos can be photographed by either attractions or news agencies for the use in newspapers and these days on the internet. This particular one is an associated press photo showing the construction of Main Street USA at Walt Disney World. Read the blurb and let me know what the mistake is between the blurb and the photo in the comments. As might be guessed, the vast majority of the items in the archive were professionally produced usually a collaboration between the attraction and a printing company, but some of the artifacts are directly from tourists themselves. Going back to postcards, the comments written on them can sometimes provide useful information, but most of the tourist-created items are photos and slides, such as these. There's not a lot to say about them. Some are dated, especially the slides, as much of the time there's a month and a year stamped on the slide frame. Much of the time they're not particularly useful, but at least they give an idea of what tourists thought was interesting enough to photograph. So you might be saying, that's cool, you've got a nice memorabilia collection, much like others collect stamps, comic books, or shot glasses. And yes, it is that, but the archive also constitutes a valuable resource, one that tells the history of Florida tourism in ways generally unavailable elsewhere. There's a huge amount of information on rides, shows, interactions, landscape designs, buildings, promotions, and special events. Each attraction tried their best to convey to the public what their facility had to offer. Some of the information is sensationalized, but in general, it's accurate. And because the archive contains multiple documents on many attractions that were produced throughout their operational life, it's possible to tell the growth of attractions. For an obvious example, Walt Disney World opened in 1971 with what at the time was a large development including a theme park, several resort hotels, and a campground. And these documents can show when three additional parks and all the rest of Walt Disney World were being built and then opened. The documents have also allowed for creation of a timeline with opening and closing dates for most of Florida's attractions, as well as provide information as to their affiliations with various organizations. Most documents are richly illustrated, many times with full-color photographs, even at a time when most visitors were only using black and white film. 
The images show how bright and colorful the attractions, and indeed Florida, was. It's all these factors that I have used in creating the videos on Stingray Tom's Florida. Thank you again for watching another of my videos. I appreciate it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.